Kamala Harris recently announced her new economic platform with a number of policy proposals that I wanted to go over and explain what exactly they are so that then I can explain which ones I think are good, which ones I think are bad, and what better way to do that than with a tier list in the brat style of course. So starting with the most talked about one is of course the price controls. Kamala Harris announced that she wanted to stop grocery store price gouging. It's not super clear how she would do this, but it's going to come down to limiting um, how much companies can raise prices on certain things. In other words, a price control. And the first thing that we should mention is that um, although we did experience high inflation in 2021 and 2022, I mean, it's come back down. We just got that really good CPI report for July, when where inflation actually beat expectations, it was unexpectedly low. And for grocery prices specifically, that those have come down a lot. Monthly inflation has been near zero since February last year. And year over year inflation has been under 2% since November last year. That's also not even accounting for wage growth, which in many cases has kept out with or even outpaced that inflation. Measuring since the start of the COVID recession, wages are up 25.5% and grocery prices are up only 25.2%. So they actually slightly outpaced the rate of grocery um, grocery price inflation. So maybe there was a time to address this, but that time has since passed. And secondly, it should be noted, if you want to do price controls, grocery stores are probably one of the worst areas they can do it. To the extent that greedflation exists, it probably doesn't happen in grocery stores. They operate at very low margins. They operate at like an average of 3%, which is well below the S&P's 500 average profit margin, which is 11.5%. We have data showing that although grocery prices increased a lot, that increase did not translate into grocery store profits. Now, I should mention there are a few cases of um, greedflation or what most economists refer to as rent-seeking behavior. Um, in, in food prices. So you may remember back in December, a lot of egg producers uh, actually got fined for a price fixing scheme that they were involved in back in the early 2000s, back in 2004. But that was enforced uh, uh, through with our current enforcement mechanisms. It, that There was no need for price controls there. We already had the laws in a book to go after these companies and use our current enforcement mechanisms to find them. And I think we should continue doing that because price controls are usually just not a very efficient policy. They usually end up causing shortages. Without getting too deep into microeconomics here, the reason why that is is because producers are generally less willing to produce and sell items at a lower price. But at the same time, the now mandated lower prices causes the quantity demanded by consumers to go up so that it ends up causing a shortage. So with all that said, I'm going to go ahead and put these um, price controls in F tier. It's just a policy that could have having major negative effects to address a basically non-existent issue by now. Um, <laughs> I'd really like to see Harris focus on, on other things. Hopefully this is not a main focus for her. Next up, we have another commonly criticized policy on Twitter. That is the $25,000 subsidy for first time home buyers. Now, the biggest issue people have with this is that although it will help some people buy their first home, which is nice, you are just subsidizing demand and not addressing the root issue of the housing crisis, which is a shortage of supply. Typically, you don't want to fall into the trap of subsidizing demand every time something gets too expensive without addressing the actual supply issue. A lot of people criticize Biden for doing similar things with his tax credits. However, okay, these policies make a little more sense when you understand that housing is at least partially constrained by those boomers who refuse to downsides. Right now, more empty nest boomers own homes than millennials with kids. With that context and the fact that um, Biden's plan also included additional credits for people to sell homes, I do think these start to make more sense. You want to, I mean, you're incentivizing boomers to finally downsize and then giving younger people the means to buy those homes that boomers just freed up. So for that reason, I will put this in C tier. Although I don't, I don't think it's the best way to address these issues, obviously. There are reasons to do it, and there are a lot, le a lot less downsides to it than um, price controls. What is probably the best way to address it is by building more homes. Thankfully, Kamala Harris has announced that she does want to build more than 3 million new homes by giving a tax incentive for homeowners to build affordable housing, as well as um, giving $40 billion to finance these homes to local, uh, to local governments. Now, I think this is a great policy. Housing affordability is a major, major issue in America right now. There's a lot of good data to suggest that um, building homes is a great way to bring down the price of homes. I love that Kamala Harris is embracing her inner Yimby. I love, I love to see Yimbyism in, in federal politics, okay? 
obviously headed straight towards mega-based policy. Now on to the Obamacare or Affordable Care Act or just ACA subsidies. Um, under the American Rescue Plan, which was uh, one of the stimulus bills, the government basically started giving out more money to people who were buying um, buying health insurance through ACA marketplaces. These were then extended by the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, all the way to 2025. And um, Harris, has continue, or Harris has vowed to continue renewing them. I think that's a pretty good idea. A lot of data shows that not only does increase the amount of people enrolled in, in, in um, with health insurance, it also brought down premiums by 44%. Healthcare costs have increased a lot in America. Although, and I, although I do think we need a better long-term plan for dealing with this issue, this is a great way to deliver means-tested benefits to the people who need them most to help them manage their healthcare costs. So I'm going to go ahead and put this in A tier. Continuing on the theme of healthcare, she has vowed to continue Biden's policies of using federal funds to, to forgive outstanding medical debt. Again, I, although I do, again, think we need a better long-term plan for this type of stuff, I do think this is a great way to help Americans. I'm from North Carolina, which is the state that she is actually modeling this program off of. We've, we've done a lot of medical debt forgiveness here, thanks to my man, uh, Democrat Governor Roy Cooper. I think it's great to see this enacted on a federal level as well. I'm going to go ahead and put this in A tier. Up next is the expanded child tax credit, or really, I should say the expanded expanded child tax credit biden already expanded the child tax credit under the american rescue plan to three thousand six hundred dollars for children under the age of five and harris has promised to expand it again to six thousand dollars although only for the first year of a child's life now listen okay i do think this is a good policy but i guess the issue i have is inflation has come down a lot this tax credit is not as needed as it used to be because families just don't need the money as much I think now is the time to start switching to more universal style benefits. Every program has an opportunity to cost. And as you know, inflation come down. I don't see much of a need for these type of means tested benefits, um, especially of the size. I prefer more universal style benefits. Um, and for that reason, listen, there may be a hot take. I'm putting it in a B tier. Obviously, I still think it's something good. Um, I would just like to see better universal benefits. Moving back to healthcare, Harris plans to expand the IRA's provisions that limit drug prices and cap yearly out-of-pocket expenses for all prescription for all prescription drugs at two thousand dollars for everyone, not just seniors and Medicare. You know, the first thing I did in this video was criticize price ceilings, so you might expect me not to like this. But there are two big things that make this different. The first being the demand for medical products is nearly perfectly inelastic in, ec in economic terms. What that means is the demand doesn't really change based on the price. Think of jelly beans versus insulin. If the price of jelly beans goes up, well, you don't need jelly beans. You can just not buy jelly beans. And if you still want something sweet, you can just buy gummy worms. Versus uh, if the price of insulin goes up, well, it doesn't really matter how much the price of insulin goes up. You're still going to buy about the same amount of insulin because you need it to survive. Because of that, uh, these types of uh, price ceilings um, don't, don't cause the same type of dead weight loss or distortionary effects. That, um, that the other price ceilings do. They don't cause the same type of shortages. Um, the second thing that makes it different is um, I, I think there is genuine um, rent-seeking behavior in the prescription drugs market. You know, the U.S. pays a lot more for the same drugs than other countries do. So I think capping out-of-pocket expenses as well as giving Medicare the ability to, to um, continue negotiating um, drug prices down, which Kamala Harris is also about to do, is overall a really good thing. So I'm going to go ahead and put this policy again in A tier. Next up, expanding the earned income tax credit. If you don't know, this is just a refundable tax credit given to low and middle income people. I think it's a really great benefit that's applied more broadly than a lot of other benefits than, uh, for example, the child tax credit. It also phases in and out slowly, which avoids a lot of issues with welfare cliffs and incentivize people not to work. Um, and it actually increases the supply of labor because it it phases in slowly. So it incentivizes you to work because you get more benefits as your income increases for a certain amount of time. And I, that's why a lot of people compare it to the minimum wage. And it's generally considered to be a, basically a, a more economically efficient way of helping a lot of low-income people. So overall, I think it's a really good policy. I think it's a really economically efficient way of helping poor people. So it's going in the mega-based um, mega, mega based tier. Lastly, we have a policy she actually committed to uh, to before the rest of these, which is, that being no tax on tips, uh, which he committed to a few weeks after Trump committed to the same policy. Now, I'm not really a fan of this policy because there are just much better ways to help low income people. <laughs> um, only 5% of low income jobs are tip jobs and that decreases as income goes up. Um, secondly, you're punishing those other 95% of low income people relative to the 5% that are working tip jobs. <laughs> 
And then also you're treating the same jobs um, differently because in some states, some states like California mandate that um, have, have already moved away from tipping and like mandate a living wage for restaurant employees. So now you're punishing a server in California relative to a server in Alabama. I also don't see a very good reason why tipped um, tips shouldn't be counted as taxable income. You know, I think there are good reasons to do, to separate, for example, capital income and labor income. You know, capital income is is um, the money you get from saving and investing and holding on to appreciating assets. I think that's pretty distinct from labor income, which is labor you just get from working. It makes sense to tax them differently so we can um, pull some levers with the incentives there and just say incentivize people to save more. Um, I don't see a good reason why tips are distinct enough to do that. And secondly, um, I don't want, I don't, I think we should probably be moving away from tipping. I don't really like that a lot of low income people are relying on tips for their income. And this type of policy just incentivizes more, more tipping. Um, that being said, I mean, it, it, this policy would help that those 5% of low income people who rely on tips. Um, and it, I mean, clearly would not de destroy the economy or anything. So, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put it in C tier. It's, I mean, it's not horrible. So there you have it. Those are Kamala Harris's new economic policies that she has proposed. Um, overall, a lot of good ideas, some bad ones, but I think it's a really great platform to run on. If you disagree though, uh, you can tell me in the comments. I do ask if you like this video, you leave, you leave a like that really helps out with the algorithm and subscribe to uh, watch more stuff like this. Yeah. Thanks for watching. See you next time.